Hey folks, it's Maxi here and welcome to another TW 2020 video. It's AEW time and it's pay-per-view time with AEW Revolution. Our first time doing the February pay-per-view and hopefully it can be a, a success as we head off to Double or Nothing in a couple of months time. So already kind of putting plans together which will hopefully be a, an extremely stacked card and hopefully will help with the future development of AEW Wrestling. We nearly, we nearly took up the full show, it's 225 minutes, we just took up 217 of that, uh, even managing a few things on the pre-show, just to try and get some people over, give them exposure, and uh, help their stats develop effectively, because I say you only get a limited amount of time on television. That second brand is looking highly likely after Double or Nothing, and I've even toyed with the idea of making AW 3 hours, so, um, or Dynamite 3 hours, so we'll see how that goes down. But for now, this is your February pay-per-view. This is AW Revolution. So venue-wise, we opted for Flushing, New York. And just under 45,000. I was hoping to just get over that and get the sell out, but not to be. So pre-show action, and we started with about the had a decent reaction from the crowd, but terrible wrestling. And we had Priscilla Kelly defeat Tenille Dashwood in 8 minutes and 20 by submission with a tilt a world dragon sleeper following a distraction from Darby Allen, who's with her obviously husband and wife. So we're putting them together in TW. Pretty level in terms of in-ring performance. A vocal crowd still not thrilled with Tenille, but we'll work on that. But we're pushing Priscilla going forward, so the, the victory for her is good. And a 44 rated matchup to boot. Uh, after this we see on looking Eva Luno and Stu Grayson and they basically kind of nod in approval and just say well done Priscilla you've done the Dark Order proud here and a wee nod to of course Darby Allen. So that's a 50 rated segment. We then had the promo absolute Ricky Starks just getting himself over sent to the crowd you know Obviously he's aligned with the Titans, but you know, it's to show that he has his own man as well. And he's going to take a good victory here, just show how damn good he is. And that's a 51 rated promo there. And his match was against Austin Gunn. And it was in a pre-show matchup that had decent reaction from the crowd. And subpar wrestling. And we had Ricky Starks defeat Austin Gunn in 709 by pinfall with a Buster Keaton. So a 42 rated segment here, good matchup. We actually to protect Austin. He obviously starts really over in this mod, so we decided we'll keep him strong, keep him remotely happy, but Ricky starts, picks up the win, and the final bit of action on the pre-show. It's time for the actual pay-per-view itself, and we started off quite hot. We started with a 10-man tag, and it was a decent match-up that saw the team of Orange Cassidy, the Jurassic Express, and Best Friends defeat the Dark Order, in this case Brody Lee, Stu Grayson, Eva Luno, Alex Reynolds and John Silver in 1350 when Jungle Boy pinned Alex Reynolds. In terms of a ring performance there you can see way above everybody else is Orange Cassidy and Brody Lee. Not so much the likes of Reynolds and Silver, who obviously need to be built up a good bit. But there's a few there I can kind of like progress with as well which is like sort of the Jurassic Express. But this was really just to kind of Build Jurassic Express up a little bit, give a good victory to Best Friends, continue the Orange Cassidy thing with uh, obviously Darby Allen, he's had issues with, but obviously Brody Lee's like, I'm going to lead these losers to victory. But it is Alex Reynolds that just not good at all. So a 61 overall, Reynolds off his game, Brody's getting stale, and after the matchup, he calls up Alex Reynolds, he grabs the papers, and he throws them in the face of Alex Reynolds, sending them way to the the ground basically. So a 37 segment there. Next matchup was the six women tag we've been promoting as we try and get a lot of them to gain skills where the crowd will accept them. And it was about the had a decent reaction from the crowd but subpar wrestling as a blonde tirage Ashley Lane, Ali and Penelope Ford defeated Diona Peruzzo, Chris Statlander and Tony Storm in 9.30 when Ali pinned Diona with this out face buster. 
So a 50 rated match up here, obviously the four ladies of the crowd are not thrilled to see. So give you an idea what I'm trying to book here is Ashley's obviously going to be the leader, she's got the most loveliness. Ali has a lot of loveliness in this, so I may as well utilise that. Penelope Ford, someone we can develop. And then on the babyface side, Tony Storm's obviously a very good performer. Chris Statlander as well. Same with Diona. So if we get them to develop and give them these opportunities, it can only be win-win for the women's division going forward. And that's obviously not including Riho, Hikaru Shida, and the many other talents that we've got in this division. Honestly, we could pretty much have a, a massive tournament with them all. But I want to get them to a stage where none of them have this. So it's up to us to help develop the skills to ensure that is the case. But a 50 rated matchup and a very successful debut for the Blontourage. Next up was more six man tag team action. There was a decent matchup that saw Tyler Bate and the Young Bucks defeat Sean Spears, the Butcher and the Blade, in 1407 when Nick Jackson pinned Sean Spears with a 450 splash. Weak link was the Butcher, which is a shame, but a very good 74 performance. Or match up anyway, great performances from the Bucks, both win 88. Uh, the Butcher, unfortunately, doesn't work with Tully Blanchard there. He accompanied the, the team to the ring. But uh, yeah, we, we obviously kind of keep jobbing out the Young Bucks. You need to give them victories. But hopefully, again, good exposure for the Butcher and the Blade. And hopefully, Tyler Bate can certainly benefit from being alongside and getting the victory. I've noticed as well, though. Recently, even if guys haven't been winning, or guys or girls haven't been winning on pay-per-view, since the 1.17 patch, they've still been gaining pop and defeat, which is quite good. So, happy with that. Next up, more action, and it was about that had great heat and good wrestling as the Sex Gods, Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara, defeated the Titans in 1342 when Chris Jericho pinned Brian Cage with the Judas Effect. This means the Sex Gods win the AEW World Tag Titles. So a 70 matchup, Jericho the weakest performer, which he'll cover everything in a promo aspect, but in ring, that's all on Sammy. Just felt like there's big plans for Jericho and Guevara going forward, or Guevara going forward. And the Titans, I feel I do need more guys in the main event, so I might be pushing both of them towards that. Um, we'll see how I can get them to work out that way. But uh, I just felt like for where I want to go, especially for Double or Nothing, it was good to put the titles on the Sex God so we can build towards that. And the really celebration after the matchup, we are the champions, the bubbly's out, Sammy's singing Judas, and it's an 80 rated segment. Jericho came across very well. Next up, we had a good matchup for the Women's Championship, and it was Nikki Storm who defeated Shayna Baszler in 1459 by disqualification, meaning that Nikki retains her championship because of the DQ. A 73 matchup is probably the best women's match I've had in any of my saves, so it's a good base point that we can start heading towards the 80s. But Nikki brought it to a whole new level. Shayna had a good impressive 66. And obviously if Shayna's been disqualified, then she's beaten somebody down. But Nikki, being assaulted, there's a saviour to chase off Shayna Baszler and it is the debuting Heidi Lovelace. So she debuted her grunge rocker gimmick at an initial rating of great. Well she looked dreadful in this segment, I just feel like whilst there is other women that have signed that you've saw, Heidi Lovelace made a bit more sense as someone that Shayna would actually run from. So a 57 performance here adding to an ever growing and ever stacked women's division. TNT Championship time and it was about that had good heat and decent wrestling as Claudio Castagnoli defeated Jake Hager in 1347 with the neutraliser. A sixth defence of that championship for Castagnoli. Just keep him getting some good victories. Yeah, nothing really special to say there. Both guys were pretty close in performance. And a 67 does the job for that championship. We start to get near the nitty gritty of the pay per view the last few matches of the night. Uh, and basically, in this little segment, it's a little fun segment, just talking about Kenny and Austin watching each other's back, getting ready to face the Lichard brothers, but at the same time, they come together, they announce the reveal of the next, or the first ever, I should say, AW video game. I think if you're going to do that for a laugh kind of storyline, then you may as well have the two biggest gamers together in doing so. So a 34 rated segment, 
for AEW, or 2K, AEW, whatever you want to call it. And the matchup itself was superb. Austin Creed and Kenny Omega defeat the Lucha Brothers in 1947, when Kenny Omega pinned Pentagon Jr. with the one-winged angel. Austin Creed was a weak link, though. An 82 is fantastic. Three performances over uh, an 80. Kenny even blasted an 87. Austin Creed with a 60, but he's also getting better at his gimmick, so delighted with that. As I say, it doesn't really matter how that scored, because it's all down to the main event. But very happy we get Austin Creed and Kenny Omega to bring such a good performance. Next up, over the top entrance for Cody62. It's a 5 minute angle. Lack of anything interesting happening is because it's 5 minutes. If you could make it 4 minutes, it'd be perfect, but... It's Cody, it's an AW pay-per-view. He's going to have an over-the-top entrance. So despite his fantastic performance, we get a 62 rated segment. This match, I'm really interested to see how it draws because it's a, a lengthy match. 87, fantastic and exceptional matchup. Cody defeats Pac in 31-33 by pinfall with a beautiful disaster. 79 performance from Cody, 88 from Pac. And an 87 segment there to, to cover that. If he's going to be producing performances like with Pac, I need to find a way of getting Cody into that title picture. But keeping that storyline going in real life where he can't challenge for the belt. So we might need to try and work our way around that somehow again. We've already done it once. Can we do it again? So it's an 87, pro, uh, 87 matchup. Just a few negatives. Morale for Cody and inconsistency for Pac. So Cody's morale is obviously because of the Brandy stuff. But we're going to be in a position where we can kind of throw money at them, so we'll keep them happier that way. Cody offers a handshake, but Pac just walks off, wants nothing to do with him. And that gets us 78. In event time, John Moxley says, There'll be no Butcher, there'll be no Blade, there'll be no Sean Spears. This is my time one-on-one -on -one with Highman. I am going to take back the AEW Championship and there'll be nothing the Highman can do about it. And that's an 85. So the main event match, Hangman, John Moxley for the title. Just a 78, which is disappointing. But an exceptional matchup as Hangman Page defeats John Moxley in 27.53 by pinfall when the Adam's apple happened, following interference from MGF. So Hangman makes his first defence. Disappointing that it was a 78, especially when you had Moxley with a 96 performance to Hangman 77. The lack of psychology is probably going to take it down for about 4 or 5 points, that would have been about an 82 or an 83, so it's time to get some psychological workers up, up there. But uh, yeah, MGF we gave surgery to, he's back a wee bit earlier, and the crowd are starting to get bumped out. I thought I turned that off. But anyway, we finished the show, and it's just a confrontation between MGF and Moxley. Moxley's too hot, he doesn't want to go after MGF, you know, he's already struggling as it is, and MGF just is like, nope, I'll deal with you in more time, so, 82, I think with a 70 matchup and our highest promo was about an 80, I think we might be looking about an 80 for a show, and 78, just a wee bit under what predicted, but again, it's all down to that, putting all your, all your apples in the Highman page, Moxley basket, that show could be an 85 if Cody V Pack main event, but your title's got a main event, and a 45 regions just means everywhere by the US. So leave pay-per-view should still be on the UK, so we'll gain that way. But uh, yeah, overall I'm still happy with it. It just lets me see that, you know, there's certain people in certain stats that won't be able to quite make it as a main event or probably the product we want to run just yet. So I'm going to really quick look at Moxley and Hangman's psychology. And then the same with Cody's and Pax, because obviously they went 30 minutes to, to last. The pay-per-view was excellent. Really struck gold with the show. Eddie Edwards is going to enter a new storyline. NXT are planning to go to PG-rated sports entertainment. Uh-oh. That might hamper that. Nick Jackson says Penelope Ford is poor psychology. We're going to give her a chance to develop. 911,000 fans watched the show. 1.49 on pay-per-view, which was 749,000 fans. That might actually be our joint highest. Let's take a look at that then. Top 100. So the show itself, 78, will still filter in at number 12, my best ever show. 
The matchup takes number one, so it's the best match in AEW history, is Cody defeats Pac. So that's quite cool to see that so many different wrestlers are, are in the cup first like top four matches. So delighted with that. Second most attended event, which is good, and the third highest in terms of buy rate. So that is fine. Size wise, we are actually so close to getting to big anyway, so that's always a positive sign, but no rush to get there. We'll, we will get there eventually, so there's no rush, rush for that. And last but not least, if we just quickly go to our roster, look who's signed. Yeah, so obviously I can't hide that spoiler, but yeah, Ace Austin's on a, a permanent written contract. Um, absolutely doing bits for me in my NXT save, and anything I've saw the impact, I'm enjoying the character, so... We'll find something for him, and hopefully we say we can really use a really good level of overness and some excellent stats to get us it. Who knows well she would prefer stats or attributes. So we wanted to check Moxley. So he took a big hit to overness because everything was getting quite high. It was in like the, the close to the 90s in most places actually. So you can see there we lost in the Great Lakes. So some places he's lost, to some places he's gained. But he's still a good bit higher than when we started back in June. But his psychology stat is a 74, so it's not horrible compared to many. And Hangman is repping a 73 psychology stat. So it's probably just the length of the match, so we'll maybe get away with it if it was about maybe 20 minutes. Who's this hatred towards? Kazarian? Ah, Kazarian, that's fine. But you can see with Hangman. Uh, so we know his psychology is 73, but look at the gain. Six days started it, and he's now 85 within the Great Lakes. So he's one person that's benefited, especially in the last couple of patches. Uh, and he's going to be someone that's going to be a key player, uh, as someone we've got over. In terms of people that did have good uh, psychology, Cody, 80. And look at because we keep booking Cody very, very strong. 70, even was 81 at the start of the month, he's 90 in some places. So uh, at one point you've got to say you've kind of got to put a title on, haven't you? Pack, on the other hand, is also a psychologist, so maybe we just need to keep giving Moxley and Hangman matches to get them to that level. Pack, I think, was in the eighty sixes. Uh, no, but he's, he doesn't actually. So he's gained a wee bit, but again, he's someone that's gained like seventeen points. So. There's things to remember, we're obviously getting bigger as company, more exposure for the wrestlers, so that again in turn is going to get their stats growing bigger than that. We'll just check one last thing on John Moxley before we finish up this Jungle Boy. And that is, has there been any gain in psychology? Well there you go, four in terms of psychology, so you'd hope by maybe another 18 months we could get that 74 to about an 80. Just got to keep putting them in good matches and hopefully. Not even good matches, just lengthy matches and, and get them in there with somebody that's got a, a high start. Let's check the thing, MGS at 74 over, so he's had a good build from 60 as well. Obviously he's just off that injury. And if we're really wanting to know who's going to be our key workers... There we go, not too many people over 78 psychology in fact. To give you an idea, Shelley 80, Jericho 90. 80 for Claudio, 80 for Cole, 80 for Finlay, so it's going to be mostly people on 80 or 81, so the ones that are on 81 have obviously gained. It's a lot of kind of retired wrestlers, um, but there are a few there that, that can certainly have long matches. Obviously, the, usually the base uh, psychologist that is 80, uh, so something like Taylor Bate hasn't moved, so you'll notice with a kill in the business mod, it tends to be like a separate number, so a rounded number I should say, so 70, 75, 80, because uh, it is, I say, a light mod, but that was it, I'm quite happy with that, it gives me more things to work towards as we try and make sure we get the best events ever, because ideally I want to get in a position with AEW where, not necessarily the biggest company in the world, but if we can get their psychology over and try and get some 100 rated matches, that's one thing I want to try and do, because I want to try and tick all the achievements off for this game, so if I could do that in this save, that would be, that'd be pretty cool. But I'm now going to go ahead and get my thinking cap on, think of a name for the March event, which will obviously go just a week before WrestleMania Endgame, because that is the first week of April. And then we'll have an April event, and we'll have Double or Muffin, and then 
we've done a full year after Double or Nothing because we started with Blood and Guts. We never done Double or Nothing, so I think keep Blood and Guts in there, and we'll keep that as a kind of War Games type themed event. But thinking cap time as we move along. So thanks for watching. Take it easy, stay safe, and hopefully I'll see you soon for some more AEW. Thanks again. Bye bye.